good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the session entitled uh, Net Zero and uh, uh, Building Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll start again. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the session entitled uh, "Net Zero and Resilient Futures: uh, Navigate Climate Challenging Challenges in Urban Development and Real Estate Sustainability." Uh, yesterday, at the Pavilion, we had a session on roadmaps. Uh, this session highlighted how important it is to mobilize all the stakeholders of the supply chain towards a net zero build environment. Today, in our session, we will deep dive on a specific aspect of the general strategy, which is adaptation and mitigation. In face of the escalating risks to our urban landscapes, and despite the well understood risk and available preventing, pre preventative knowledge, public policies often lag in prioritizing resilience. Our event seeks, seeks today to unravel this paradox, spotlighting the critical need for resilient infrastructure. Organizations globally have committed to net zero uh, carbon targets, yet aligning real estate assets with these commitments remains a real challenge. Presently, the, the framework is fragmented, necessitating a unified strategy. So today, uh, we welcome a wide range of stakeholders who will discuss, uh, express their position how they, and how they act on adaptation and mitigation. Uh, please let me introduce uh, Liz uh, Brice Bersley, <laughs> Senior Policy Counsel at USGBC, who will kindly introduce Chair Brendan Mallory. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here at COP28 at the Buildings Pavilion, and we thank our host, the Global ABC. Um, and thank you, Malia. Um, I'm Liz Beardsley from U.S. Green Building Council, and it's my great privilege to introduce Chair Mallory. Um, Mal Brenda Mallory is Chair of the Council on Environmental Quality in the Executive Office of the President. Um, in this role, she advises President Biden on environmental and natural resources policies that improve, preserve, and protect public health and the environment with the focus on climate change and environmental justice. And as we know, that means both uh, assisting in adapting to the changes that we're seeing, um, protecting health, property, and economic prosperity, um, but also making sure no one's left behind in the transition and the economic opportunities this provides. Um, Chair Mallory's had a very distinguished career with over 20 years of federal service. Um, at both the Environmental Protection Agency and Council on Environmental Quality. Um, she's a graduate of Yale and Columbia Law School, and we're so ha happy to have you here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on Water Day. I'm very excited to be able to join uh, the discussion and to hear from other experts about what they're doing uh, in this area. It's great to be here with you to discuss what it means to take on the challenge and the charge of building climate resilience and adapting to ensure we protect our communities for generations to come. Throughout the year, we have collectively experienced new extremes in the United States. Flooding that upended roads and separated families from loved ones and essential services. Devastating wildfires in Maui tore through crucial infrastructure with the effects made more severe due to the unique challenges on an island. Extreme weather and excessive heat have been the experience for so many all across the country and the world. In the United States, 90% of our counties suffered a weather disaster between 2011 and 2021. And globally, August 2023 also was the Earth's hottest August in 174 years that we've been tracking. 
These climate impacts have devastating consequences on everything from the health of our local economies to the preservation of our cultures. However, as we gather for COP28 in the face of the unprecedented set of challenges, it's important to acknowledge that this is also a critical moment of opportunity. Not to bounce back, but to bounce forward. We can build more resilient systems from each community to the national level and beyond. It's time we go beyond just coping and ad adapting to climate change. We must also transform the way we approach resilience and how we do business. We cannot just patch what was broken. We have to rebuild in a way that better protects communities in the future, and we have to deliver solutions that better prepare us for what is to come. The United States understands how imperative it is that we work across sectors and systems to build resilience to climate change. We know this work is lasting. Strengthening one community can build resilience for generations to come. And through historic investments included in legislation like the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act, President Biden has made the largest investment in addressing climate change in U.S. history. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act together dedicate more than $50 billion to advance climate resilience strategies in communities across the nation, including in communities that are the most vulnerable to climate impacts. Underserved and overburdened communities face disproportionate risk and impacts from climate change, which we know exacerbates existing inequities. So for the first time in our nation's history, the federal government has made the commitment that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. That is President Biden's Justice 40 initiative. These investments are historic, but we must ensure that the money is making real, a real difference in our communities. I'll give you a few specific examples of our resilience work uh, in action. Um, let's focus obviously on buildings. Um, we are modernizing building and energy codes through the United States' national initiative to advance building codes to ensure minimum standards for safety, health, and general welfare. We are leading by example by electrifying federal buildings with over $1 billion from the Inflation Reduction Act dedicated to upgrading buildings across the country with sustainable technologies so that they are more efficient, all electric, and powered by 100% carbon-free electricity. We are updating our processes so that by 2030, all new federal buildings will be emis uh, zero emissions. And we are using our buying power and real estate footprint to move markets, create demand, and catalyze clean energy innovation while using historic investments to decarbonize the federally owned portfolio. To catalyze the private sector investment, we launched the Climate Smart Buildings Initiative that will spur $8 billion of private sector investment by 2030 in energy savings performance contracts. This will increase efficiency and reduce emissions from our federal buildings. We are also focused on uh, federally funded, insured, and supported buildings. And just this week here at COP28, the United States joined the Buildings Breakthrough Initiative so that we can supercharge our work to move the building sector to clean energy and build resilience. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to transitioning the building sector to zero emissions and cutting one-third of greenhouse gas emissions that come from buildings. With approximately 130 million buildings in the U.S., we are working to send a clear market signal and set a consistent target, backed by verifiable emissions data to move the entire building sector to zero. Together, these actions will lower costs for families and businesses and help communities access funding to better protect the places where they live, work, and learn. Let me share just a few examples on the resilience work. We're embedding climate resilience across the government to ensure our federal agency and their surrounding communities are proactively planning their ad adaptation. 
We're implementing the federal flood risk management standard, which ensures federally funded projects in areas prone to flooding can boost safety and better prepare for uh, future flood risks. And we're using natural ecosystems and other tools available to reduce climate impacts and ca capture and store carbon from the atmosphere and expand access to green and blue spaces. These are all pieces of a bigger picture. This fall, President Biden released the first United States National Climate Resilience Framework to identify key values, priorities, and objectives to help expand and accelerate comprehensive, locally tailored, and community-driven resilience strategies. The framework identifies core objectives that will make communities safe, healthy, equitable, and economically strong that can and should be the focus of climate resilience efforts. We hope other countries will join us to build resilience and catalyze a future that is adaptive to climate change. We must continue to work from one country to another because the climate crisis knows no borders. It is incumbent upon all of us and is part of what connects all of us today. Whether we work in the United States or across the globe, we must join together. It is our collective responsibility to transform our infrastructure to meet the challenge. So thank you all for all the work that you're doing and for your shared commitment to build a better future for all. I look forward to hearing the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair uh, Brenda Mallory, for uh, this insightful uh, keynote. I would now uh, welcome uh, Julie Prigent, uh, who is an inter international uh, affairs officer at ADEM and also co-chair of the Adaptation Global ABC Working Group. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, okay, it works. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, so, as Malia said, I'm here in my capacity of co-chair of the Adaptation Working Group of the Global ABC. I'm not going to present Global ABC because I'm in the interest of time, but also because assuming you're here or online, you already know of it. <laughs> But so there's numerous hubs in the Global ABC and our working group is tasked with the essential ta task of talking about resilience and adaptation in the building sector. Um, with my fellow coaches that you can see on the slide, so Karim, Judy, and also Kritaya that is provided by Victor, um, we're... Um, our goal is to coordinate uh, the discussions and work of our members, stakeholders from the whole value chain, the whole buildings and construction value chain, um, in order to pool expertise and resources to increase the focus on resilience. We need to ensure that the building sector, um, along its entire value chain, addresses climate risks, not only the current ones, but also the future ones. The discussion of resilience needs to be at the forefront by recognizing the vulnerability of the sector and the benefits we will get from it. Protecting people, their, belong their belongings, and essential infrastructure. We talk of engineering solutions, building codes and regulations, innovative tools, ideas, etc., and we share good practices and lessons learned. We have stakeholders from the whole value chain, and we welcome also all of you to join in. Um, the more the merrier, and like um, Ban Ki-moon said in 2014 already, we need all hands on deck. So, very quickly, um, a little overview of our work. In 2021 already, we launched an initial call to action, followed by the 10 principles for act effective action. The 10 principles are really simple, 
um, because we need people to just, you know, keep in mind those principles at the very beginning of action. We need urgency because we need to act now. We need all stakeholders in in this. We need to consider the whole process. We need mitigation and adaptation because one cannot go without the other. We do not want to get into maladaptation, for example. Uh, we need data. We need to scale up. We need nature-based solutions. We need the people involved and you know, adapted to the local context and we need finance. Um, so we also did a lot of other uh, little reports. We do uh, compile exemplary projects. We, you can find all of this on the Global ABC website. Um, and we also have a comparator of resilience assessment methodologies on the website. But so lately, we've been working on a new report, a new call to action based on surveys and interviews uh, of different stakeholders along the value chain. And following the first results, which were kind of inconsistent, um, we had to adapt our report also. And so now we are really asking, why are we not adapting? Why, we, we know we need to do this, so why are we not doing it? And so our executive summary is ready, but the whole report will be launched before the uh, Global Forum on Buildings and Climate, which happens on the 7th and 8th of March in Paris. Uh, I, I guess you know of it already, but... Um, so the, I won't go into the key takeaways because I think everyone should, you know, take the time to read through it. So now is not the time. But so yeah, this report is there because we want to launch a call to action to all actors, a waking up call. Uh, we need adaptation across the whole value chain according to each actor's capacities, a abilities, level of influence on, their, on their, their sector to get their sector to commit to adaptation. This is not a technical problem. It's not an out outreach problem. We know this needs to happen. We know tools exist. It's a policy problem, a priority problem. Adaptation is needed now and ultimately someone is going to pay. Either we are going to pay now a small amount to build greener, to build better, more resilient, or we are all going to have to pay later to help people recover. And the cost of this are going to get higher and higher. So we need to achieve resilience adaptation and resilience now from the onset. It's always better to prepare. So join us in the working group. Uh, maybe this is, you know, one part of the answer to cooperation. And together, we believe, I believe, we can achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, to, for this introduction of uh, the Global <laughs> ABC Adaptation Working Group. Uh, I will now leave the floor to uh, Cosi Ad Ad Adonio, Adonio uh, who is the Executive Director of the Climate and Development Network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Malia. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm so glad to join you uh, in this event. Um, I would like to thank especially organizers of this event and also uh, Energy 2050 for inviting me. Today, I would like to start with this quick story. of this woman called Kosiwa. Uh, you know, Kosiwa is a single widow with two children. Uh, his activity, the only income activity, generating activity Kosiwa is doing is to sell smoked fish. With this activity, Kosiwa in Togo managed to take care of his children 
but also to pay their school fees. Because you are manage also to set up a team with a microfinance who help her get two bank loans. The, the first one she use it to to buy a a plot land somewhere out of Lome in Togo, and the second one to build a small house for his family. The question is here is to is to ask how is it possible for Kosiwa who is living with this kind of uh, social social uh, grade can think about sustainable housing? That is the first question. The second one is that the government department department who are supposed to construct infrastructures manage to construct a retention water reservoir beside the house of Kosiwa. At the first rain, the retention water reservoir overflowed and the entire house of Kosiwa was flooded. This is the the reality, Africa countries, even Togo, Togo population or even Africa population are, are experiencing. That's my first quick story to introduce this presentation. And for me, this resume all, all those things I, I could say here. You see, in the second picture, You see in this picture, those pictures are pictures take this year in Togo. And those all all what we are you are seeing there are uh, retention reservoir in Togo flooded. When coming to the cities, today's event is important for us to to to, to to take it as a call of action is the most most word I want to, to, to use. Uh, putting this aspect of sustainable housing issue up for this discussion is more effectively a call to action. There is a pressing need for non-state actors who are at the heart of the uh, climate hazards experienced by population or intermediate and small town to be more involved in the reflection and formulation of approach to solution for sustainable housing. That's why we are enjoying this exercise alongside the leading features of this, pa of this panel. Above all, I would like to bring the voice of Kosiwa and also the communities who know nothing or have no choice to, to find out whether they are habitat is sustainable or not. Those who immediate concern remains a place to live, regardless of the basic condition associated with. The role of uh, civil society organization, and in particular, that of climate and development network, fundamentally integrate the realities of these most vulnerable communities into climate policies and planning. RCD, my organization, is made up of today of 80 member organizations across Africa and France. We, we are playing important role in interna international climate negotiations since our creation in 2007. Our members are grassroots and advocacy players who develop concrete, pragmatic projects to help communities prone to these vulnerabilities. Returning specifically to the cities, the United Nations estimated in 2018 that around 55% of Africa population lived in urban areas. The majority 
of these African cities are compact urban clusters, as you are seeing it in on the on on this picture. This picture is from uh, Dynamic de l'Urbanisation Africaine, produced by United Nations. So you will see that all those cities are from Nigeria to Benin, Togo, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire are close each to each other. So the majority of these African countries are compact cross area. Is, is that to say that group of cities with more than 30,000 30, population located less than 100 kilometers from each other by road, and with a total urban population of more than 2.5 million. To continue, the reality in these urban areas is that urbanization plans are generally outdated and cannot keep pace with the speed of urban expansion. The priority concern of the population are not focused on the sustainability, sustainability housing, as I said before. In the context of vulnerability, exposure and poverty, the most important thing is to find shelter without other consideration. In the absence of urbanization plans and investment policies for sustainable housing, supported by materialized, supported and materialized by political decision makers, and also supported by investors, it is complex matter to combine the need of grassroots communities with the desire of sustainable housing. Population are every time victims of poor urban infrastructure in Africa and with no access to drinking and energy. You can see here, it's another picture taken from Lomé. In absence of sustainable connection of electricity, population are managing to have, have electricity them, themselves. And this is a danger for, for them. So it's what we are experiencing in, count, in our countries. And for what I, I would like to, to make this recommendation from the, the Climate Change Africa Conference read in, read in October in, in Cameroon. The, the recommendation called for empowering local governments because they are the first actor in the front. They need more capacity building. They need more power to, pl to plan and to execute it. They need more finance also. The second one is, is to put land planning and governance at the height of strategies. Because uh, in our countries, one of the key problems is land governance. The third one is developing the housing offer. You know, we don't, we don't really have social housing in our, in our countries. That's why population are used to buy themselves lands and construct on it. In, apart from social housing, how investors and government can help plan where and construct sustainable housing. The fourth one is to develop a on urban energy and climate policy. This image shows how the, the lack of planning of energy efficiency and connection expose population to this kind of illegal connections. And reducing the vulnerability of the territories, we have to make a good diagnosis of what is the vulnerabilities of these countries and to plan the right, right urban development policies. And the sixth one is to strengthen and adapt financing. Those who need the financing, they might have the financing. These are the six recommendations I want to share with you coming from the the Climate Change Africa conference held in Yaoundé in this year. Well, thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Kossi uh, Adjonye, for uh, uh, this uh, strong uh, call for action. Um, as your last point was, like we need to adapt uh, the finance uh, mechanisms towards adaptation and mitigation. This is a good transition for the panel that it's coming, uh, the discussion that we, uh, we will have now. The uh, discussion will be uh, cut in two parts. Uh, the first part will be on finance mechanism, and the second part will be uh, we will expose uh, concrete tools and examples from the ground uh, still related to adaptation and mitigation. So I will kindly now uh, invite uh, on the stage, I will start with Isidoro Tapia, uh, which is a senior climate officer at the European Investment Bank. Have a seat, thank you. Uh, Ryan Kolker, <laughs> Vice President uh, Innovation at International Court Council. Lirz uh, Beardsley, uh, Senior Policy Council at the US uh, Green Building um, Council. Uh, Dr. Stefan uh, Butner, Director Global Strategy and Impact at the Institute for Energy Efficiency in Production and also Chair of the UNICE Task Force on Industrial Energy Efficiency. And uh, Lea Anderson, who uh, is uh, the Advocacy and Public Affairs Manager at Solar Impulse Foundation. No, no, I will stay, stand still. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Stefan uh, and uh, Stefan Poufari, who is joining us from France, he is the CEO at Energy uh, Stefan, can you hear us? Are you with us? Absolutely. And everything is fine. Thank you so much, Maria. Yeah. yeah. So the first panel will discuss the new financing mechanisms for adaptation and mitigation. Um, we will explore the intersectionality of training initiatives, the specific practices, uh, the symbiotic relationship between technologies, uh, codes, and uh, finance mechanism. I will ask to all of you the same question, and I expect from you to give you to give me your uh, specific and particular perspective in your area and your sector. Uh, first question, what is the cost of inaction of adaptation and mitigation in your area? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> so briefly, we have 20 minutes for this first panel, <laughs> so I expect some keywords. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's start with um, maybe, um, I would, okay, I, I can see that the Dr. Stefan is here to speak. <laughs> Well, if you, if, if you say so. Is that on? Yeah, okay, good. Well, what are opportunity costs of inaction? That, that is a tough and yet easy question. Think of uh, a situation where you could save money today, but you decide to wait until tomorrow, and then the amount of money that you could have saved from today to tomorrow, you will never be able to save again. It's gone. And that means whatever we don't do now cannot be recovered ever again. It's like uh, if you, if you um, wait for finding a job, that doesn't mean your entry salary is gone by one year. If you start one year later, it's your highest salary that will be gone. And it's similar here. Um, so that's the, the time element. Also, when we're thinking of when do we start to act, um, if we wait until everybody is doing it, maybe there is not enough skilled personnel. There is not enough green energy available in the grid. There is not enough planning capacity in the in the uh, authorizing offices. Um, but also, it's a question of consideration of the other costs that are usually always overlooked, and that is emission costs. That's the price risks 
all those things that we usually do not put in in the public tender process. Um, and that can be super costly if we then wake up on, on the next morning or a few months or years later, realizing that we went for the most economic offer, but that didn't consider all those extra costs in the long run, so the life cycle costs. And there, um, particularly in the business area, we are looking for um, we are looking for payback times that are relatively short, but those are uh, okay if they are on individual tools and machinery. But if the goal is to avoid climate change, to progress even further, or to save lives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we need to look for what is what constellations of measures is systemically efficient, say by 2030, which from today's point of time would be six years and a little bit, and then you may get to a completely different constellation of things that unleash their power in combination. And therefore, if we don't do that, we suffer these opportunity costs of inaction. Thank you. Yeah. I'll uh, give you an example um, from the US. The, the National Institute of Building Sciences looked at the uh, sort of benefits from investing early in things like building codes uh, in things like uh, retrofits, uh, specifically for adaptation, and really found that for uh, every dollar spent on uh, pre-hazard mitigation, we actually result in anywhere from three to thirteen dollars of benefit. And when we look at things specifically like building codes, it's uh, eleven dollars for every one dollar invested, and that benefit really accrues to the entire ecosystem. So it's the community's uh, reduced need to respond. Uh, when a disaster happens for shelter needs, its impacts on uh, the financial sector, uh, business losses, uh, property losses, um, even sort of insurance administrative uh, costs that are associated with that. Um, and so that's a very sort of tangible uh, dollar impact. You can also then, uh, you know, certainly go to um, the impact that it has on individual lives as well. Um, and how that sort of trickles through, you know, the entire system. So, you know, even if we don't, uh, even if we think about sort of all of the pieces of communities, you know, whether that's schools, whether that's employers, hospitals, uh, there's, there's sort of those impacts across the entire spectrum of a community. And then to sort of pull the, the sort of flip side on um, the, the climate uh, mitigation aspects, you know, if we think about uh, particularly, you know, I think in the, in the U.S., but probably applicable universally, uh, low and moderate income households spend uh, a significant proportion of uh, their monthly income uh, on utility bills. Um, for sort of the, the median household in the U.S., it's somewhere between 3 and 6%. Uh, we've seen in some communities it's up to 30%. Um, and so if you think sort of holistically about, um, you know, those households, um, that's not their only stress. Uh, They're certainly stressed from sort of other uh, decisions they need to, need to make in their lives. And so if we can look at sort of reducing that energy burden, um, you know, that, that certainly helps enhance the, the social uh, resilience of those communities as well. Please, please. I think we're all anxious to get to the opportunities and the actions more than the, the cost, but I'll just um, just briefly add here that, you know, you can see from the pictures that were shared um, and many others that are around COP, just there's, we can lose lives, right? And it's not only about property damage and economic loss, but, but you know, there's real lives at stake. And then um, community stability, you know, when the whole community is wiped out, um, there's no work available and the rebuilding uh, cannot be done, then that really causes instability, which has a whole ripple effect on, um, you know, on the, the, even the country, so. Leah? Thank you, Liz. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, cost of inaction, and uh, indeed I'd like to oppose that perhaps to uh, the opportunities in action. Um, because there are many, uh, that's what uh, we focus on at the Solar Impulse Foundation. Um, but for example, uh, Chair Mallory mentioned earlier, it is true today is Water, Agriculture and Food Day at the COP28. Uh, today we know that 33% uh, of water consumption in the world happens in cities. We're talking about urban landscapes here today. When you know that you can reclaim 60% of the heat that is used in uh, showers, 
uh, through you know, very innovative, efficient, and actually uh, cost-effective uh, systems. It makes no sense uh, that uh, we are not implementing those solutions. I think here the key word is efficiency, uh, and through very easily implementable systems, we can actually um, well move from a, a, a narrative that, 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 that talks about cost of inaction to the opportunities that exist today in acting preemptively, proactively, and uh, urgently. Thank you, Stéphane. Okay, uh, are you able to add something on the cost of inaction? Yes, I'm more than happy. So, in fact, uh, I think the question is um, is a very long, long-lasting question since decade. We, we repeat that since so many times. So, at the end, um, I, I will also prefer going to the opportunity to act and um, just also to say that at the end, we know we have so many figures. And we are still not, uh, let's say, implementing them. You speak about the building code, we can speak about the financial mechanisms, we can speak about the MRV dedicated to buildings, we can speak about so many points, and at the end, we are not still implementing. So what I want to mention is that at the end, we, we really need to focus on the regulatory frameworks to implement things, because as we are working in the adaptation working group, so somebody will have to pay at the end. Whatever we consider, like Cosi was explaining at the end, the, the poor guys somewhere, we, we would suffer by, uh, let's say, bad adapting, uh, let's say, household. Somebody will have to pay. So the cost of inaction, I would say, it's billion or billion. Go to the adaptation needs. We will have 300 billion per year for in Africa. If we go for resilience need, it will be thousands of billions. So the cost of inadaptation of maladaptation is impressive. On the other side, the cost of adaptation and the cost of action is almost nothing. Especially if we have a top-down and a bottom-up process with a very clear regulatory frameworks. What I want to focus on is to say, if we apply the same rules for everyone, at the end, the same rules is not costly. If we have different rules, different opportunity, it is clear the market will not play the game. So this is also one point we need to focus on. We have solution, but this solution needs the frameworks. Because he was speaking about the local government, the local communities. Yeah. It can be part of the story, but all these guys, they don't have power. If you look to local governments in Africa, for example, they don't have power to plan, they don't have power to do, to have some loans, they don't have to do the power to make investment, they don't have power to do so many things. So at the end, even if we speak about good technology, good process, they will not be in position to implement because so far it is not their mandate. So what we suggest in Energy 2050 is not working on decentralization, is working more clearly about a dialogue with, let's say, national and local communities to try to figure out some key points where we can just separate and offer the opportunity for these guys to lead the process. And again, they need the legal frameworks and associated finance to be in position to implement this kind of project. So this is, frankly, we need to re-ask this question in the absolutely opposite, let's say, direction. Thank you, Stéphane. Isidoro, uh, you, you have to respond now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will try to uh, say something different. Um, I mean, there's something that has been said, actually. Uh, buildings represent around one third of uh, global emissions. Uh, <laughs> it, it, indeed, it's, it's a lot. So yeah. it's, it, it's, it's, it's one third of uh, we have to reduce to, to zero. Um, what is the cost of uh, inaction? Uh, I'm going to give you two numbers. Uh, the um, share of new buildings that are built every year is only 1% of the overall uh, building stock. And the renovation rate of the existing building stock is also only 1%. Uh, globally. That means that every year 2% of the existing building stock is either built, newly built or renovated. That means that even if those buildings achieve the highest standard, it will take almost 50 years to renovate the entire building stock, <coughs> which is much longer than the time that we have to get to, to net zero. So what uh, do we need to do? We need to uh, act both on increasing the standards for new buildings and increasing the standards for existing buildings. And this is uh, going to the uh, solutions or to the actions, uh, what we are doing at the uh, European Investment Bank. 
uh, the EU climate, uh, the EU Climate Bank, we are financing both new buildings achieving the highest standards and the renovation of existing buildings. Only last year, we lent almost uh, five billion uh, euros to the to the building sector, roughly 50% to new buildings and 50% to the renovation of existing buildings, and we are doing so by a number of uh, financial products going from green mortgages to loans to uh, homeowners associations, loans to, to banks, loans to uh, construction companies. We need to have a wide range of financial products to be able to uh, get to the uh, granular investment, to the small investments that typically uh, consist of the uh, renovation projects. Okay, thank you, Isidoro. Uh, according uh, to you, uh, pan uh, my dear panelists, uh, do you think uh, the efforts of the European Investment Bank are well directed? Uh, where, uh, according to you, where are the investment needed in, and what type of investments? Who wants to? I'll jump in a bit Thank here. You. Um, so not specifically on on that, but to our sharing some of the U.S. experience. <clears throat> excuse me. The um, U.S. Housing and Urban Development Department has a number of programs that support uh, both renovation and new construction of sustainable and resilient homes. So uh, right now there's a green and resilient housing program that provides like three different levels of renovation and funding support. Um, there's an emphasis on affordable housing uh, in these programs, which is important and really leverages some of the existing tools that are out there, including uh, codes and above code standards. Um, there's also some green mortgage pro products in the US for multifamily housing, particularly. Um, and I think we would like to see that more universally across the country and having private finance also uh, do more. There are, um, in, our, in the U.S., we have a federal government backs many mortgages, but not all. And then commercial buildings are often uh, private lending uh, situations or using their own capital. So we kind of would like to work towards aligning all of these so that every dollar spent um, investing in a building, new building or a renovation um, is going to prioritize efficiency, um, decarbonization, and resilience all together because they're all integrated. And to, to realize that lifetime savings, as Ryan pointed to, in terms of resilience benefits. So I think we have like some good policies in the U.S. and we can expand them. And also just excited for the building's breakthrough where um, the U.S. government and EU can start to share some of these best practices and help other countries set up some of these levers. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, Dr. Stefan. I can only second what you just said. Um, I was about to say approaches such as pay as you save and, and um, on bill re refinancing and so on can be enablers because uh, what we have seen, for example, in Germany, the, the building sector nearly folded in the past couple of months because people are struggling with enormously risen energy prices. At the same time, they would like to structurally reduce them by taking action, but yet that has become super expensive because of inflation. And then uh, just a few days ago, we, we have heard news from, was it the European Parliament or the Commission founding, uh, deciding that there's not a worst first uh, principle, meaning that is where the worst categories of buildings have to be renovated by a certain point of time. It's more that member states, as I understand, now have to undertake uh, efforts that the worst, that so and so many percent of the building stock are being renovated to save that amount of carbon emissions, even though it would be advisable or good to get rid of the worst emitters first. But how do you afford that? And um, that is the critical issue. How and that applies to any type of stake, any type of stakeholder. How do you get the lift for the infrastructure investment, the heat pump, the insulation, all that sort of stuff? And there um, is one super tangible tangible example. About 15 years ago, there was um, a statement by a housing minister that they put in place 100,000 units of social housing. That was a 10 years plan. And I asked them, 
um, what energy performance standard these buildings will have. And I didn't get a response. And the, the conclusion for me was, so is it social for you to build because it's cheap? Or is it social for those who are living in it? Because essentially, depending on how the governance system is set up, there will be another pocket of the state or federal government that will have to help the tenants to be able to afford the bills. So that certainly is not a sustainable action. So we need to enable house occupants and house owners to make, to make the lift, to make the shift, and uh, prepare also for what to adapt to, particularly in terms of cooling. So what do we need? How, how can we do that with least energy, with least cost? Because as we have, as we have seen and as I've been told by um, people from Togo yesterday, the best technology isn't necessarily a thing that, that is needed right now. It's more the simple, easy to roll out solution. Isidora, please. Thank you. Let me add something on this. On this, uh, one of the reasons, uh, in my view, to uh, support both new buildings and the renovation of existing existing buildings is uh, there are there are some synergies in in both sectors. I mean, typically, uh, typically new technologies are adapted uh, through new buildings. So let's say uh, better insulation, uh, heat pumps, uh, solar PV panels, and as uh, time goes, they are progress progressively. Uh, uh, adapted into the uh, renovation of, uh, of, of existing buildings. And actually, uh, what we have seen in the past, and I think this is one of the most important messages to, to pass, as you said, is that a building with the highest standards is actually not expensive, it's extremely uh, cheap. We have been able to, to finance uh, social housing projects actually in the EU. There is one project in Navarra, for instance, that uh, we financed uh, recently with uh, very high energy performance standards, with passive house standards. It's social housing, so it's, it's cheap. It's saving the uh, electricity and the heat bill of the, of the owners of the, uh, of the buildings by almost a factor of eight. Uh, and we have been able to, to finance this because just taking into account energy considerations into the construction and into the design of a, of a building is not something expensive, it's actually very, very cheap. And there are social passive houses around for a long time. You only need to be smart in how to design them. So uh, picking up on sort of the challenge of um, renovation only happening maybe every you know 50 years 20 years whatever it is um, if we don't take that opportunity to build in both adaptation and mitigation opportunities uh, we've lost that opportunity uh, and so really it's about identifying where the co-benefits are where can we uh, sort of have those interventions that provide both um, climate mitigation and adaptation uh, opportunities i think the other piece sort of picking up on uh, what liz mentioned um, and, and Chair Mallory mentioned on sort of the whole of government approach around things like building codes, which really sort of set that support mechanism of sort of what is that expectation? If folks are going to be financing uh, specific projects, specific activities, being able to have sort of a common basis for this is what we expect, you know, coming out of that process. Um, and so, you know, housing, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development sort of setting uh, requirements of, you know, every a uh, HUD dollar going into housing, you know, needs to meet a minimum uh, requirement that's up to, you know, the latest codes uh, is certainly a key part of that. Um, Liz mentioned sort of opportunities in the federal, federally backed mortgage space. Uh, I think another sort of huge opportunity to provide uh, that consistency. And then even if, um, you know, a, a homeowner uh, is not getting a federally backed mortgage, the more sort of home builders trades know about sort of those requirements, they're likely to do that even in uh, homes that are not sort of federally backed. And so that really provides uh, across the entire ecosystem real opportunities uh, to drive the ball forward. Um, perhaps uh, on uh, what was said, I liked this number of 1% of building being uh, renovated uh, uh, and uh, retrofitted annually. Um, 
I think something uh, that's quite interesting to mention, perhaps, of course, there are many turnkey solutions. Uh, we can retrofit buildings, we can insulate better, but there are also more capex-intensive solutions. I'm thinking geothermal. Uh, we talked about heating and cooling already, a huge issue, uh, of course. Um, it, is a, it is a very capex-intensive uh, solution, but uh, DRI is extremely interesting. However, it is the type of implementation that asks for a precising uh, um, uh, process uh, and uh, study and this would be something extremely interesting to uh, to, 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 to look uh, at the financing of because it deters many many buildings owner because before you can implement it obviously uh, such systems need to be fitted absolutely to the grounds you're looking at so I think this is typically something we don't often uh, think about uh, and perhaps in my view that it, that is not incentivized enough so you have many many uh, you know major uh, real estate owners or uh, perhaps as well when we're talking social housing as before who don't even know the potential that lies uh, literally underneath their feet so it would be something i think interesting to to discuss and know how that can be definitely incentivized uh, dr stefan would like to respond and then we will ha leave uh, uh, stefan Buffari to also intervene thank you well i okay, guess stefan, that brings uh, which one which stefan uh, <laughs> you will be the first you will be the first okay go ahead that, that brings us to, to the critical point, and that is training. Training of those people that can make the judgment call of what's right for me. And creating the trust among the clients that the person that I get advice from is trustworthy and knows his or her job across the different areas of energy improvement. And that's a tricky thing. It's really hard to find people that know about a sufficient amount on insulation, on technologies, on self-generation, on storage, and what is the right overall configuration of those technologies for the specific circumstances. And that's what we really need to dive into deep. Your turn. <laughs> okay, so, so maybe I will jump in. So just to say, uh, to add a figure, uh, to what already have been said, uh, just uh, for Africa, uh, the next, uh, let's say, two decades, 70% of the building stock has to be built. So it means we have also an incredible opportunity, 70% of the new buildings to be organized are, are yet to be built. So it means it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity. So going back to, to what can be, I think, the granularity of the finance tools and also about the legal framework has to be adapted to the reality. So what does, that, what does it mean? It means, for example, we need to, to go to a direction, probably, to, de, to design and to conceive buildings and also looking for additionality. What does it mean? It means it is exactly the same wording we are using for the carbon market, additionality. And like that, we can also demonstrate what, what is needed and what will be the benefits if we improve some efficient solution. And in that case, financing can also just focus on this additionality perspective. So like that, we reduce the constraints and also we make, and as it was say, education. I think education not only about the, the designer, the, the, public, the public authority, but also the consumer. So to understand if he do that, he will benefit that. And like that also, if we start to finance and to provide some tools, we can just focus on this additionality perspective. And just one point, going back again to the uh, let's say legal frameworks. I think in so many cases everything is blocked by the legal frameworks. When we spoke in, in Europe, for example, about putting some PV panels, it's good because the guy, the guys can sell the extra, let's say, energy produce. But in almost all the developing countries, it is forbidden. So this kind of example just demonstrate how we block the market's perspective in so many ways because we don't create a value about the additionality perspective and we don't take into account what could be the benefits both at individuals and also at the collective, let's say, level, about all these kind of solutions, which are really powerful to change and to create sustainable perspective in the built environment. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if uh, I can gather some feedback already from the public, if you have uh, some uh, questions. I have a question. <laughs> I mean, we're talking here about finance and you know, finance mechanisms for adaptation mitigation. I think one important element that I want to bring up is that we are looking at a just transition. And you know, I'm, th I'm, I'm asking you, what do you think, how can we get this to the people? 
And I mean, we had a presentation earlier by Corsia Fedo, uh, you know, even our representative from the US also mentioned about, you know, the vulnerability and the people that actually really need the support. How do we get the funding to go to the right place? And I think that's, that's more my question because, you know, in the climate we have been discussing a lot of things, when I see a number of projects that are LEED certified or all the beautiful buildings that we can do, most of the time it's commercial buildings, offices, shopping malls, luxury hotels, and on the housing part, we don't see that much. And I think we really need to get it, if we want to change things, we need to change it in the residential sector. So I know it's a tough question, but I just want to hear, you, hear from you what, what you think about what can we do there? How can we drive this for, for, for the people? Thank you. It's indeed a tough question, I would say, and I think, uh, no, we have been all here for a few days and there is a tension between um, climate objectives and, and just transition, which is just in there. But I would say that, I mean, typically you support solar PV panels, solar PV panels go or are installed by uh, high income people. Uh, you support electric vehicles, they are bought by high income people. But in the case of uh, building renovation, actually it has a very positive effect on uh, the uh, redistribution so typically building renovation uh, support uh, mostly low-income people so it's one of the uh, uh, net zero strategies is one of the net zero policies which actually has a very positive effect on the uh, redistribution of, of, of income uh, it has been mentioned uh, passive house uh, standards were developed some decades ago as uh, standards for uh, social housing uh, projects and it has been implemented very su successfully on uh, social housing projects so in the case, I mean, I think the, the question is very valid. Uh, in the case of buildings, I think there is not that much tension. Actually, I think we can uh, support both dimensions, the just transition and the, and the net zero transition at the same time. Interesting point. I want to point to the, to, to the global south, because I agree with you, renovation, Europe, I mean, we're working on it, US, absolutely. But that's not where I'm worried. I'm worried about what Stefan said, about 70% of the buildings have not yet been built. And you know that most of the people in those countries live in slums. I mean, at least a big part of the people live in, you know, that's where I'm thinking. And that's where we need the transformation to happen, in, in my view. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I came in this work with the development angle before my environmental angle. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is an angle that I, I feel is really important that we discuss here. Valia? Um, St Stefan, you wanted to intervene? Yes, but uh, yes, please. possible, yes. Just, just to say, I think that the, the question of Jonathan, I will say it is the most, let's say, tricky question because this is a good one, uh, by the way. Because all the, okay, we many times we focus about uh, what's going on in Europe and it's working well in state and it's working well because we have quite a lot of subsidy mechanisms to support low incomes uh, to, to renovate their buildings. But going back to the global south, this is a tricky point. And again, we, we need, and, and I think this is really the good question because guys will be, you know, the, the trusty process is quite something very important. And what Scorsi, Jonathan, and me, we are rising is that, that at the end, we need to also find a solution for these poor guys. And the solution, it has to be a mix. We have many, many good examples, many good, uh, let's say, uh, uh, things with vernacular, with raw materials, uh, local materials, with, uh, with, with, with quite a lot of things that to be done. But again, it has to be a mix and we, we need finance. We need, uh, let's say, do donations, we need funds. And in that case, we need also the ones to, we need to create a new process. Frankly, it's not working. Today is not working. If we look on the ground, um, it's not working. And frankly, frank also, I'm not so sure in the next decade it will work if we don't change the paradigm. So the uh, international funder has to look to social houses uh, in developing countries. Otherwise, it will be a risky situation, not only about uh, buildings, energy and climate, but also about the social risk, because these guys are struggling 
but they are more and more unhappy about what is going on. And they are, you know, you, you heard about the debate, lost and damaged, but also housing is somewhere of lost and damaged when you have so everything destroyed regularly. And we know we don't have the finance there, and we don't have the finance even this fund, in other fund. So we, we are, this is not the point here, but we have produced many studies on this issue. Because I really think all this, let's say, uh, very accessible solution, which are practical enough to make the game, are available. And this is what is very crazy, because it is not costly, we can implement them, but we need to mix a good coalition. I don't remember who was speaking about that, but this coalition has to be part of federal governments, governments, local governments, international donors, banks, uh, and also the private. But the private will not do the game with this low incomes a situation just because it is not profitable. So if we wanted to make it profitable with, let's say, small enterprise locally based, we need to change the paradigm. So these guys have to make business when they do social housings to be sustainable. And I really think this is a challenging year. And if we need to make a call of action, a statement, it has to be this one. Because our good EU example, our American example, are very ins inspiring solutions, but they are not applicable in the South, no. And we need to find a bridge to connect this good solution to the reality of these guys living in very difficult place with, let's say, heat temperature, flooding, and many things. So this is just the point, but I really think this is one of the key questions we need to ask and to demonstrate we are concerned about, to make everything trusty about the, the built environment. Um, just to make it quickly respond to clarify on lead. So um, we do have a significant number of multifamily projects and about 20 to 30 percent of the units are low income. But all of the multifamily, it just tends to be less uh, high profile than, you know, the hotels and, and so on. Um, and we also have many public buildings, including about 11,000 certified schools around the globe. And that's a main use type that helps spread best practices around the world. So um, anyways, on the Global South, I totally agree. I, you know, I keep waiting for the concrete industry to have a carbon binding concrete that paired with that growth could be a real solution. We're not quite there yet, but in the meantime, I think the solution is, uh, or the, the imperative is for us all to collaborate and get strong building codes in those countries. I mean, that to drive that new construction. Um, and that will take uh, technical assistance, funding for capacity, um, and, and a lot of diplomacy likely to um, to get there. But, you know, when buildings and homes are built with no codes, it's just, you don't know, it's not gonna be safe. It's not gonna be energy efficient. It's a loss, that's the lost opportunity that we started this conversation with. So I think that's the, the bare minimum to start with. So I'll just pick up on two things. I mean, I think one of the sort of exciting things about the countries that have signed on to the building's breakthrough, it's probably 50-50 north-south. So I think that's a real opportunity um, to sort of leverage folks that have already seen the need. Um, and then picking up on, um, you know, Liz's comment relative to sort of codes and capacity building, um, you know, one of the things that ICC really recognized and, and many others uh, is that need to really support um, things like building codes but also sort of the broader ecosystem that really supports their effectiveness. And so we've established an initiative uh, called Building Capacity for uh, Sustainable and Resilient Buildings, really sort of recognizing that all of those pieces need to come together and that, uh, you know, countries are at sort of various different stages in that process. And if we don't sort of take that holistic vision, really recognizing that, um, you know, there are sort of different strategies that need to come at different times uh, through that process. Being sort of locally uh, relevant uh, is really essential. And so um, we're certainly looking forward to continuing those conversations and sort of driving those conversations forward. Thank you. Uh, Leah, you want to intervene? Uh, well, I just wanted to say very quickly that indeed it was a tricky question that I definitely don't have the a complete answer to. But what I think uh, is maybe crucial to to keep in mind is um, in in well we're talking global south here, but uh, the 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 importance of uh, locality. And so I th we're talking uh, earlier. I talked about geothermal, for example. Um, 
and not all solutions need to be uh, very, uh, very technical solutions, very capex intensive solutions. Um, I think there's something we haven't mentioned yet, perhaps is a circularity in the built environment. Uh, you're talking demolition waste. Uh, this creates local job. This create the, the, this also, uh, you know, avoids uh, you know millions of tons of uh, land, uh, of, uh, of construction waste to being sent into landfill. So uh, this is also something I think we need to promote on the ground and really create local e ecosystem for resilient uh, and sustainable built environments. Dr. Stefan, in, in yeah, one sentence, seconds. and then we will wait for Standardization yeah. can help a lot. And um, scale. That helped in this uh, social house I mentioned earlier. The, the more social houses you have connected, social passive houses, the more you can cut the cost of an expensive equipment and serve all of them at once, such as CHP or, or, or heat pumps, etc., etc. Yes, it uh, echoes the, um, the 10 uh, effective ways uh, and the call for action that uh, has been published by the Working Group on Adaptation at the Global EBC. You, you had one question. It's sort of a quick one. So uh, I'm Dr. Erica Etland. I'm with the American Institute of Architects. But Chair Mallory, I'm also kind of curious your perspective on this question, which is, you know, to your point about housing and sort of when we think about affordable housing, how are we also incentivizing developers in this who are not necessarily incentivized to optimize anything other than profit. And when we know, especially in some of these developing countries, that they're going to continue to want to develop profit, how does the US sort of serve as a model and saying, here's what strategies work? Because we've seen examples of Passive House do incredible things. But when you start to talk to those developers, you find them as sort of these gems sometimes, where they're like, well, I did just because I wanted to, not because you know I had to or felt that this was sort of my like priority. So I'm just curious, you know, from a, a U.S. perspective, where do we incentivize developers to make that the new consistent piece, whether it's multi, you know, family housing or just like individual housing? Yeah, I mean, I know that that is a central focus to the work that I think folks are doing uh, in the, in, especially in HUD, but in other agencies where there is an overlap in the issue. I don't, I don't know that there's a specific answer, and I can't tell you exactly what some of the things are that are in uh, front and center, but the focus on making sure that the affordability issues and expanding kind of the, the way in which um, we are integrating that into the, the way that we're using our federal dollars is like front and center, and I'm happy to help connect you with people who can tell you about what specifically is going on now. Yeah, I'll just add there's a mix. So there's some um, federal financial incentives, and we can give you some information on that. And also, it's back to the codes. So some states in the United States are really progressive and are really pushing towards nearly zero, even in homes. So that's um, the thing is, it's not going to happen in all the states. So we're trying to strategize with the allies of how do we use these other tools to make sure that it's equal, because that gets back to equity. Um, you know, people in any state, in every state, deserve a safe, quality, efficient, resilient home. So how do we make sure that happens, even if the states are not going to take action? And the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD, uh, a while ago came up with the scheme of LEMES and CEF, list of eligible materials and equipment, and only those materials and equipment were eligible to be supported financially through the Sustainable Energy Financing Facility, which means, in, in relation to your question, um, only if particular minimum specifics are met, this thing could receive any funding. That also links to the top 10's working group of the G20. You wanted to intervene in Zadero? Yes, yes, no, I, I was uh, going to say uh, that um, we uh, have the chance to discuss about the challenges. Uh, and actually, I mean, there are many challenges in the, in the building sector where typically uh, talking about very small investments or aggregation into uh, larger schemes is typically one of the biggest challenges. Long payback periods, but in particular there are two challenges at the moment. One is inflation cost, I think someone mentioned it, but it's uh, 
hitting the, the uh, construction and, and real estate sectors in, in many countries, and this is already having an impact. And the second one is uh, higher interest rates. So typically, what we have seen in the past, these are very capital-intensive investments. It's not only geothermal. All uh, investments in buildings are typically very uh, capital-intensive, and interest rates are changing the economics of many of uh, these investments. And this is where uh, an institutions uh, like the European Investment Bank or public banks have a more important role to play in the, in the coming years. I could jump in on that real quick. Um, we just published a report this week on the state of decarbonization for US commercial buildings. And we really tried to capture that rate of renovation because that really is hard to track, at least in the US. Um, what we, we do have some data in there, um, and it shows it is, uh, there's a stable amount of renovation, and it should increase with the Inflation Reduction Act, but not all of it is a deep energy retrofit. So that's where, again, like, I think the, we need some more levers from the financial institutions and maybe insurance to be um, really pushing that as a core. Every time you touch a building, this is your chance for resilience and efficiency. So sorry, Ryan. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think we have an obligation as the building industry to shift the dialogue from uh, first cost as the driver of decision making. Um, we should be talking total cost of ownership, total cost of rental, sort of as that driver. Because if we're focused particularly on affordability of housing, you know, we can create, you know, sort of low first cost housing, but if someone can't afford to stay there, it's not resilient. Um, and so, you know, next disaster comes, um, there is no house. Um, we have not done our job. So um, I think we need to sort of shift that dialogue um, and really have that demand for total cost um, as the driver. Thank you, Ryan. I will welcome the last question uh, from the audience and then we will do the wrap up. Thank you. So Romain Poivet from the World Benchmarking Alliance. Uh, I introduced on Monday the, the results from the, the benchmark we've done on the 50 most influential companies from the building sector. Uh, we published that in, in March. Everything is publicly available. Actually, the building sector is maybe the worst one <laughs> in terms of decarbonization. Um, uh, I showed the, 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 peak, the, the figures. It's the, the worst uh, sector aligned with the H leg, so the A-level uh, expert group recommendation regarding decarbonization. So just the facts. Uh, actually, to echo Jonathan's point on the just transition part, uh, all, the mid, all the companies score zero on the just transition part, which is quite uh, embarrassing. Um, and, uh, but I won't speak much about decarbonization. Um, I would like to um, raise the aspect of, of adaptation, because we have also developed some methodology to, to assess the, the credibility of companies' adaptation strategy and plans. And what we've seen working with companies is that uh, the main driver for uh, really uh, being involved on adaptation is whether because they have been exposed to uh, climate damages, so then they react to that, or because there is a pressure from regulations. So can we imagine that the Global Alliance for Building and Construction being the, 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 the relevant um, uh, place to really have this call for strong regulation to really put the adaptation topic of, uh, of building sector at the core? Thank you. Yes, this is. Uh, we already tried to build the moment. We already built the momentum at the building breakthrough launch uh, last 6th of December, and we will continue uh, gather all the stakeholders all around the world at the global forum in March uh, to act on uh, adaptation, uh, mitigation, and towards a net zero build environment. I will now turn to all our panelists, uh, and I would like to conclude on a positive note. Uh, so I will ask you to answer briefly uh, to what are the most promising developments for resilience in your specific area and and yeah thank you hi i have to start <laughs> um, well i mean you know i i think you know our um, code development process um, updates every three years to really capture sort of the latest knowledge, latest technologies, latest lessons learned from uh, prior disaster events. Um, I think the most sort of interesting thing um, we'll actually see in um, the 2024 editions of uh, the codes is sort of the first time specifically focusing on tornado risk um, as, you know, sort of a, a need. 
um, and having sort of specific design criteria uh, relative to, to tornadoes. I think the sort of longer term um, interesting area uh, is around extreme heat and extreme cold, which really brings in a lot of the sort of intersection of um, the sort of energy efficiency and uh, hazard resilience, uh, looking at sort of opportunities to, to mesh all of those, those two together. Isidoro? Yes, the overall, we discuss it, the building sector is a challenging uh, sector. It's one third of the emissions, so it's one third of the problem and one third of the, of the solution. The, uh, the positive news is that the, the needle is, is moving. Uh, if you compare the uh, regulation, the regulatory code, the performance standard of a building built today as compared to a building uh, built in the 70s or in the 60s, the energy consumption of the building today is almost one tenth of the, of the building uh, of all buildings. So, so from a technology perspective, uh, building standards have increased a lot and uh, in our perspective also uh, we see uh, increasing volumes uh, only 10 uh, years ago our overall lending to the building sector was less than 1 billion last year at the IB we lent uh, almost 5 billion to new and the renovation of existing building to the building sector as a whole so it's a, a big increase in a very short period of time thank you One of uh, the greatest advancements f for our activities in the past couple of months was that finally the life cycle footprint of buildings and buildings components are more moved in the center because so far we have only been looking at the energy performance of whatever is already in the building or put into the building rather than the whole streamline from the beginning to the end even though that's the thing that needs to be optimized for to to uh, avoid uh, climate disaster from increasing ev even further. And there, we, more people are now conscious that actually what the designers and factories design effectively determines on whatever happens in all sectors. So the earlier the designers on the drawing board are taking these things into consideration and make their new products one and a half degree proof, the better we are off if we can scale and so on and on the on and the second point is empowering people giving people control back giving people a say on how they can save without losing comfort and that is by creating the perception of all those many things that one can do so the the, the war in ukraine and the energy crisis last year was super shocking for for all actively and and, in act, uh, and passively affected but it taught us one thing it's creating a view of the easy things we can all do and i'm sure each company each household has about 20 percent of the energy consumption that is actually unnecessary unnecessary meaning obvious waste that we just were not able to spot and there we're making great advancements in terms of creating the perception of enabling all the stakeholders to save on the energy consumption, the water consumption. We saved a third of our water consumption last year. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah. Yes, um, in, in fact, uh, okay, try, trying to be positive and to see, uh, let's say, let's say advancement. I would say now we have a clear, let's say, picture about the data. And I think it's very important. We also start to have a clear, and I would say an efficacy uh, transparency framework, which is also important. Uh, we have a better, let's say, understanding of cost. And also we have a confrontation with realities uh, as the damage are increasing everywhere. But on the other side, we need endorsement. We need enforcement. We need watchdog. And this is quite important. We solution are there. And I will say we, we first need, because we all focus on very, let's say, uh, specific technologies, but we, we, see, we, we know since decades that we have a lot of 
and the low and the fruit. And I think it's important to implement everywhere. And I will say also one thing which is generally missing, we need, and this is, like I will say this is compulsory, we need control. And control, why? Because we need show and something, but also we need, so for that, we need training, we need tambourine, we need many things, but we need also penalties for guys which are not doing the games. So, for example, about circularity, the reuse of materials, many, many, many professionals are not respecting the skin, the skin. So we need also to, to focus again, to say, okay, if you don't play the game, if we don't respect this kind of rules, we also have penalties. And I think it's important to change the paradigm because the buildings is at the forefront of the challenges. So if we don't succeed to change the patterns in the building sectors, this is not only a question of climate em emission, this is also a question of resilience of population. So population will struggle. And not only in Africa, in Europe, look about the flooding this, this summer, about the fire, about everything. So guys are struggling. So if we don't put in place some framework, look in, in Turkey, about the, the earthquake, so everything now is connected to the built environment because people are facing the consequences. So we need also, and governments need to put in place control and penalties when guys are not respecting controls. Because putting in place a good framework, if it is not applied, makes no sense. And putting in place good scheme for financing, if they are not applied, is also something which does not make sense. So this could be the positive things. I really think we can take the challenges because solutions are there and we all know them. So that's it. So for promising developments, I think first and foremost, we seem to be in a new era of collaboration, which is so welcome. Um, we need to work together because there's so much catching up to do and so much opportunity as we've touched on um, in this discussion today. Um, I think secondly, um, we hear from our member companies that their clients are saying, what are you doing on this project for resilience? How does this, um, does this address the temperatures and the rainfall that will happen 20 years from now, 40 years in the life of this building. So there is much more awareness and uh, in terms of building resilience into projects from the beginning. Um, thirdly, what we're doing at USGBC is we are evolving our lead program with our latest version, version five, and it will require resilience assessment on all projects, including existing buildings. So we're really very excited about that. We have a resilience working group of experts that's advising us. Um, there will also be you know, different credits and opportunities to implement different strategies, achieve passive survivability, et cetera. So um, we're looking forward to rolling that out and getting feedback. Um, yes, what I think is perhaps quite positive is that we see that, of course, we need innovation in, um, in solutions, in technologies, but we do need innovation in uh, legal uh, frameworks uh, and uh, regulatory frameworks, which was mentioned earlier, of course. Um, but I feel like this is coming, this is uh, starting to being understood. We see many, I think, uh, very... Um, very interesting and hopefully promising developments. So, for example, uh, we mentioned total cost of ownership of a specific system. For example, it's starting to be taking more and more into account in uh, public tenders, for example. So we're kind of moving away from this very um, CapEx-focused uh, way to, uh, to, to consider, uh, you know, uh, tender, uh, tendering processes. Um, I think perhaps something also interesting with regards to uh, resilience is uh, in cities, at least in urban settings, is vegetalization. This is really becoming a key because we're starting to understand that, well, yeah, it's nice to have green buildings and, uh, and, uh, and it looks pretty in pictures, but it's also extremely uh, useful and we can fight uh, the urban heat effects. Uh, we can also better manage uh, rainwater, for example. And so I feel like the, uh, the many opportunities that are offered by such solutions are, are starting to be understood by not only us uh, on stage right now, uh, but also policymakers, uh, also implementers, and uh, hopefully uh, very soon uh, real estate owners. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone that participated to the discussion today, Lea, uh, Liz, Stefan, and Stefan Isidoro, uh, Ryan, Kosi uh, and Chair uh, Brenda Mallory. I would like to thank you to everyone who asked questions and to participated to the session. I hope I see you again today at 2 p.m. for the session, the last session of the Global ABC uh, Buildings Pavilion on Buildings, Energy and Beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you.
보여주세요.